Yeah, this could be good for ruling people out, surely. Uh, but it's not just great for ruling people in. I don't understand. I'm pretty sure that I'm in the vast minority when I say this, but I don't actually mind jury duty. This is, uh, I, I, I've never done jury duty. I will never have to do jury duty. This is Kevin, he wrote today's script. I don't have to do it because where I live, there are no juries, it's just judges. And in the UK, where I could theoretically have been called for jury duty in the past, it's super rare because juries are super rare. Like, I don't think I really know anyone who's ever done jury duty, but you can get called for it if you are on the electoral register, which I am not. I don't remember asking you a goddamn thing. I've always found the legal process to be fascinating, and the idea of serving on a jury as a certain appeal, at least so long as it's a short trial since most states don't require your employer to pay you while you have jury duty, and the payment for serving on a jury is an average of $5 a day. What the f***? <laughs> They're not even going to pay you, like, minimum wage? If anything at all, so I'd be much less excited about sitting in on a three-month murder case. Although, Kevin, it would make for a cracking casual criminalist script when you're done. If it's interesting, it could just be like a boring murder, husband kills wife. But then it wouldn't be three months long, would it? It could make for a pretty interesting casual criminalist episode, though. Kevin and I, same page. But despite actually wanting to sit on a jury, I've only been impaneled once. Is that the official term? It was a relatively simple case, and it definitely highlighted the value of having a good lawyer. After the first day of trial, I was certain that the defendant was guilty, but the prosecution had done such a terrible job, there was no reasonable basis on which I could have voted to convict. I think it may have been the guy's first trial or something, but it was painful to watch. The second day went mostly the same, until the defendant, who was also a lawyer, made the bold and completely unnecessary decision to take the stand. Stand. We's a lawyer and the defendant? Okay. Don't do it. Just don't do it. His testimony was about an hour of self-incrimination, and he gleefully perjured himself. He's a lawyer? What the f are you doing? One of the charges was for drunk driving, and the prosecutor asked the defendant if he was aware that sake had a higher alcohol content than beer. It's common knowledge that sake is generally more than twice as strong as beer, but the defendant said, I know for a fact that's not true, while trying to hold back a smile. <laughs> you terrible lawyer and defendant. Even though this was a blatant lie, he knew the prosecutor hadn't entered anything into evidence to disprove the statement. After closing statements, it was time to deliberate, at which point I became furious. There were 14 of us sitting in the jury box, and I was one of the two randomly selected to be an alternate, meaning after two days in court, I didn't even get to vote or talk to the other jurors. Ah, uh, this is, uh, I know about this. I, I didn't finish it. I started watching a TV show with that dude from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, where he's, he's like, there's some dude who thinks he's on a jury, but it's not, it's all made up, and they get up to all sorts of crazy antics. So I know about alternates because of that. Fascinating tangent, Simon, thank you. The deliberation took exactly as long as it was required to get a free lunch provided for us, after which they returned the verdict, not guilty. Even more surprising was their rationale, which was that they found the defendant more trustworthy because he was a lawyer. <laughs> what? Who's like, ah, yes, lawyers, upstanding members of society. I know, it's kind of like a meme. I actually think lawyers are probably quite honest. Maybe that's just me. And that's why I fight for you, Albuquerque. Better call Saul. Saul Goodman, attorney at law. 505-164-C-A-L-L. 505-164-C-A-L-L. Every poll I can find shows that 70 to 80% of Americans believe lawyers are unethical and untrustworthy. Yet these 12 jurors decided there was no way that this lawyer could ever tell a lie. While this miscarriage of justice was the result of ignorance or easily manipulated jurors, as well as some prosecutorial incompetence, there has been a growing problem with juries making poor or prejudicial decisions thanks to the media, and it starts before trial. Jury Selection According to the Sixth Amendment, a defendant in the United States has the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury. But the phrase impartial jury is often a difficult requirement to fulfill, especially since the amendment also specifies that the trial will be held in whatever jurisdiction the crime was committed. This has been a problem for as long as the United States has existed, but it's only gotten worse in recent years. Yeah, media is going to bias the shit out of a trial. Back when news traveled slower, finding jurors who were unaware of the purported details of the case wasn't that difficult unless the case was exceptionally horrific. Even if a crime was relatively high profile, there was still a limit to the speed and distance at which news could travel. The media has changed all of that. Television news really increased how far and quickly information could travel, and this can make jury selections take forever. Coverage of the O.J. Simpson case was inescapable, so when it came time to go to trial, the jury selection process took two months to complete. But that's nothing compared to a case from just a few years earlier in 1989. 
When Richard Ramirez went to trial, it took a full nine months to select a jury. Admittedly, these are pretty obvious outliers. It doesn't take nearly that long on average, and with someone whose crimes were as terrible as Richard Ramirez, it was always going to be harder than average to select a jury. <laughs> says, does anyone on the jury have a problem like with the defendants? Like, yes, yeah, Richard fucking Ramirez in it. <laughs> Put him in the chair. Uh, we opt to dismiss juror 16. <laughs> But thanks to social media addiction, this effect now extends beyond just the most high-profile cases in the country, and the bar for what qualifies as news has been significantly lowered. Because of Facebook, I can now tell you every single time somebody in my town sees a coyote, which is a daily occurrence, so you best believe I hear the details of every crime in town within minutes of it happening. I'm not an outlier here either, except for the part about coyotes, as Facebook is full of overly gossipy community groups for every town, city, and county in America. And since the whole point of social media is engagement, this can lead to over-sensationalized accounts of events. Yeah, I don't use Facebook, haven't used Facebook in years, and getting off there was a decision for the better. It's a waste of time. What could simply be reported as, this is what happened and this person has been charged with a crime, is instead likely to be reported in the most dramatic and often impartial way possible, creating a strong public bias in the case. Unfortunately, as long as we insist on jury trials, finding impartial juries for major crimes is always going to be an issue for which there may not be a good solution. But once you've found that jury, the next step is to pray that they don't f*** it up with unrealistic expectations. The CSI effect. People love their crime dramas and police procedurals. I f love CSI. Like, I haven't watched it in years, but when I was a kid, the original C CSI Las Vegas, loved that show. Couldn't get enough of it. Looking at the list of the most watched network shows from 2022 to 2023, the two top shows are Sunday Night Football and Monday Night Football, because America. But ignoring football, the top three shows are NCIS, FBI, and Blue Buds. I've never heard of FBI. There's just a show called FBI. I bet it's awesome. <laughs> While these genres never really appealed to me, unless the show also happened to be a comic book spin-off like Lucifer and I, Zombie. Oh, I watched Lucifer. It was weird. And it was one of these other shows where it's just like, eventually I just gave up because it was a good concept and I really liked it. But then it's like, okay, I get it. I've never heard of iZombie. It's an undeniable truth that they have dominated broadcast television for the past two decades. And this has been seen by lawyers as a giant problem. These shows tend to utilize the same tropes, and they have become so ubiquitous that they're warping people's perception of reality when it comes to police investigations and legal proceedings. One of the most egregious examples, and one that you're all certainly aware of, is the CSI trick of enhancing an image. No one believes that real, although now with AI it's like, yeah, 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 zoom and enhance, and it's like, okay! <laughs> It's like, how is this possible? And I know it's not like perfectly accurate and stuff, but the upscaling on old photos is just sometimes outrageously good. His glasses. There's a reflection. That's the new Evita's baseball team. Are you sure about that? This is obviously not possible. While camera resolutions have improved dramatically, so that you can often zoom in further than was once possible, you can't just zoom in indefinitely and say enhance and magically expect a computer to show you what was there. What's that comedy? There's like a comedy skit or something where they're like, zoom in on that marble. And then they're like, oh, there's a reflection of a window in that marble. And they're like, zoom in on that window. And then they're like, oh, in the window, there's reflected a face. Zoom in on that face. And it, he's taken was that actually a serious thing line. done in a show, or was that a skit? Because it sounds like a skit. Or did I just imagine this? Someone let me know. Enhance. Enhance. And a lot of CCTV cameras are old and sh so investigators aren't going to be able to take footage from an ATM camera, then zoom in and enhance the reflection in a person's glasses. I think most people understand by now that this specific example is just Hollywood nonsense, but the CSI effect has caused people to expect high-tech forensic analysis in nearly every case. The unfortunate reality is that that simply isn't possible. Sometimes that evidence doesn't exist for one reason or another, and even when it does exist, it may not be as definitive as people want it to be. Whenever fingerprints, DNA, ballistics, or anything else are tested on crime shows, the lab technicians will inevitably declare that they found a match. The word match is the golden standard of evidence, but it's one the forensics experts don't use. They will instead say things like consistent with, as the results are unlikely to have a 100% probability. Yeah, if someone's like consistent with in CSI, I'll be like, well, it's not them then. 
they just think it's them, and then they're going to go down the path for it being them, and then they're going to find the real killer when they get a match. Not only are experts not going to use the word match, but they may not even run the tests that people expect them to run. Shows like CSI don't exist in the real world, so they can run whatever the f tests they want on every single case, no matter how minor the case may be. There's no episode of CSI where they decide not to run DNA analysis on a blood sample because the results will take 11 months and waste taxpayer money, all for a burglary case. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. Jurors don't consider things like cost or time constraints when it comes to these tests, so low-tech forensic analysis simply won't do. I guess today isn't this groundhog's day. Just get your scraper, Darren. And speaking of CSI not taking place in the real world, this allows them to ignore not only logistical constraints of excessive testing, but basic science as well. While most people understand that enhancing images isn't real, CSI is full of other junk science that jurors expect to see presented to them in courtrooms. <laughs> it's kind of amazing. CSI is it's all up. Things like lie detector tests, bite mark analysis, and facial reconstruction of a skull to help identify a body show up on CSI all the time. But of those examples, only bite mark analysis is even allowed to be used in court, and even that has been widely discredited. Holy sh! Isn't also blood splatter analysis like bad science? And that whole show Dexter was about him being a blood splatter analyst. Is that true? Sadly, these simple facts do little to curb jurors' unrealistic expectations. The term CSI effect was first coined in 2004 in an article in USA Today. And the following year, it was brought to the forefront of public consciousness following what many saw as a surprising verdict in a high-profile case. Emmy Award-winning actor Robert Blake was accused of murdering his wife, Bonnie Lee Bakley. There was limited physical evidence, and the prosecution relied mainly on the testimony of 70 witnesses. Among those witnesses were two stuntmen, both of whom claimed that Blake had tried to pay them to murder his wife. If they were to be believed, that would be some pretty strong evidence, but apparently they were not to be believed because Blake was acquitted. LA District Attorney Stephen Cooley famously referred to the jurors as being incredibly stupid following the trial. <laughs> Sounds like you needed to... I mean, look, dude, it's your responsibility as the lawyer to explain why the person's guilty to a group of incredibly stupid people. It's incredibly stupid that you didn't manage to do that. Allegedly. There may have been plenty of witness statements, but the trial lacked what the jurors were after, a mountain of irrefutable forensic evidence. There was no blood splatter on Blake, and the gunpowder residue on his hands was ruled inconclusive, so the jury didn't feel they could convict. After the trial, multiple jurors even admitted that they believed Blake was guilty, but that they felt that they shouldn't convict him without clear forensic evidence of his guilt. While this case was one of the first examples to gain a lot of attention, there are plenty of others. People have been acquitted of murder even when multiple eyewitnesses saw them do it. The the CSI effect has caused the burden of proof to skyrocket, potentially letting a large number of pe guilty people go free. Oh, I saw this. He trained his dog to do it. Oh. <laughs> Well, that's the claim anyway, and the majority of lawyers believe that the CSI effect is poisoning the well of jurors. But is this really the case, or is this just a pile of anecdotal evidence for a bunch of sore losers? Well, that's the million dollar question. Judges, lawyers, and a decent segment of the population are absolutely convinced that the CSI effect is a real thing, but it has been shown to be exceptionally difficult to prove. According to a study out of Stanford back in 2008, at acquittal rates across the United States did rise following the premiere of CSI, although they had been on an upward trend. After continuing to rise for a couple of years, they then started bouncing up and down. Multiple other studies have been conducted since then, and to date, none of the numbers provide a compelling argument that the CSI effect is resulting in the guilty being acquitted en masse. So, how is that possible? If the majority of lawyers and judges believe that this is affecting how juries vote, why don't the numbers back that up? Well, there's been this long-held belief known as Blackstone's Ratio, made famous by William Blackstone. He stated, It is better that ten guilty persons escape than one innocent person suffer. Yeah, it's why we have, um, beyond all reasonable doubt. So, it's better people, guilty people go free than an innocent person goes to prison. But maybe we're actually doing both. The reverse CSI effect. Just like the CSI effect could be responsible for guilty parties escaping conviction because of the lack of forensic evidence, the reverse CSI effect is believed to result in innocent people being convicted because of the presence of forensic evidence. Wait, how's that? If there's forensic evidence, isn't it like a lock-in? 
Like, I understand the other one, but I don't understand how this one's gonna work. There's a good chance that statement made a number of you do a double take, yes, including me, and it admittedly felt a little weird to write. Now, you might be thinking, well, hold on a minute, Kevin. If there's forensic evidence, then obviously the person must be guilty, and that's the way we've all been trained to think, but the reality is much more complicated than that. There are good eyewitness accounts and bad eyewitness accounts. Somebody who saw a person commit a crime right in front of them is more reliable than a person who witnessed the crime from 100 meters away while trying to drunk doll their ex. Similarly, there is both weak and strong forensic evidence, but this bit of nuance seems to have eluded most people. Take fingerprints, for example. In shows like CSI, they are always able to pull complete pristine fingerprints from surfaces, but here in the real world, this basically never happens. Fingerprints collected are often shitty partial prints with some amount of smudging. They're not useless, and a forensic expert may testify that it's possible for the print to have come from the accused party, but they can't say with absolute certainty that it came from that person. That qualifying statement may be ignored, especially because it's not really possible to quantify how likely it is in any way. Not that quantifying it is actually helpful anyway. This comes up more often with DNA, especially mitochondrial DNA. Finding usable samples of DNA isn't easy. If a pristine sample of nuclear DNA can be found and matches the suspect, the odds that the suspect belonged to someone else are one in a billion or even one in multiple billions. This is pretty definitive, but this sort of analysis isn't always possible. The human genome contains about three billion base pairs, but forensic testing of DNA DNA usually only checks up to 24 specific markers. Now, to be fair, every human is 99.9% .9 genetically identical, and each of these markers is multiple pairs long. But it's still a small sample of the DNA that they're looking at. And if the samples are damaged or degraded, it may only be possible to create a partial match. And this is when things get really bad. Let's say a sample was damaged, so only six or seven of the genetic markers could be checked. A forensic expert might say that the accused person was a partial match, and there's a one in a hundred thousand chance that another random person would be a match for that sample. This, I'd say one in a hundred thousand is beyond reasonable doubt in my mind. This gets a bit tricky because people aren't very good when it comes to big numbers. Most people hear that and think the odds that the defendant are innocent are one in a hundred thousand. Wait, that's exactly what I thought. Oh no, am I not good with big numbers? What it actually means is that there are 850 people in New York City alone who would match that DNA sample. Well, yes, that doesn't change the fact that it's still one in a hundred thousand, right? That's just about the number of people in New York City. That's not the way you're supposed to do it, Dad. They want us to do it this I don't way. know that way. Why would they change math? And if the DNA sample is so degraded that they can only use mitochondrial DNA, things can become a disaster. Mitochondrial DNA has much less variation than nuclear DNA because it's only inherited from your mother. So let's take Jane Doe, who was born in 1600 as an example. All of Jane's children would have identical mitochondrial DNA to her. Every one of her daughter's children would also have identical mitochondrial DNA, and same with all the children of their daughters. Now, continue that for a few hundred more years, take into account the fact that for a lot of time that average couple had seven to ten children, and that is a load of people with matching mitochondrial DNA. And don't forget that Jane's sisters and all of their descendants are going to have the same DNA as well. Using this sort of DNA is not useless. Yeah, this could be good for ruling people out, surely. Uh, but it's not just great for ruling people in. I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand, bitch. I don't understand. I don't understand, bitch. But it shouldn't promote a high level of confidence. None of this even addresses other issues like contaminated samples. There's the famous case of the Phantom of Heilbronn, a series of completely unrelated murders that were only tied together by the presence of DNA from a single unidentified woman, who turned out to be a lab tech or something, right? I remember making a casual criminalist or some such about this. That woman was eventually identified as being ah, a factory worker where the DNA swabs had been produced, at which point police realized that the samples were all useless. Of course, that particular example is actually more likely to result in wrongful acquittal than wrongful conviction. If the prosecution has a rock-solid case against somebody, but then DNA evidence shows it doesn't match, that's a good way to get a person off. As a side note, I think it's really unfair that lawyers get paid to do that, but when I try to get someone off in a courtroom, I get arrested. Jesus. <laughs> Unnecessarily sexual joke there, Kevin. Anyway, there's also the glaring issue that, generally speaking, forensic evidence is all circumstantial. That's not to say that circumstantial evidence is by any means bad or weak, and oftentimes it's the strongest evidence there is, but forensics are still rarely as definitive as people believe. Fingerprints and DNA might show that a person was at the scene of a crime, but neither can say when they were there, for how long, or exactly how, what they were doing. Even a person having gunpowder residue on their hands doesn't mean they fired a gun. That goes everywhere, and it can easily pass from a person's hand to a, from, a, from a contaminated surface. Stop acting like you know the way ahead, like you know the rules. 
There are no rules, ma'am. We're lost. No, no, no. So what can we do about all of this? The simple solution would be to try better to educate the American people. But our public school system has been fighting that losing battle for centuries. Instead, courts are trying to handle the matter themselves. That seems pretty smart. Like, you gotta educate people on, like, that's the lawyer's job. It's common to be given a questionnaire before being seated for trial, and potential jurors may now be asked if they require indisputable scientific proof in order to find a person guilty. When the judge gives the jury instructions, they may also make comments regarding the CSI effect in their instructions, though this can be a tricky proposition. In Maryland alone, there have been at least five cases overturned because the judge gave improper instructions while trying to guard against the CSI effect. The whole thing is a bit of a tightrope walk, but at least courts are trying to tackle the problem. As for the reverse CSI effect, that's a bit harder to instruct juries on. It's easy to tell a jury that CSI isn't real life and actual cases rarely have a mountain of high-tech forensic evidence. It's a lot harder to explain the forensic evidence is extremely nuanced, and that any numbers or probabilities you hear likely don't mean what you think they do. But ultimately, this all begs the question of whether or not any of this is real. I'm really curious what you'll take on this, Simon, because I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, I've given my thoughts on it throughout. I think, this, it, I mean, it's definitely, there's no studies to show that it is, but I feel like people are definitely affected by media. Is the lack of empirical evidence for the CSI effect really because the resulting acquittals are perfectly balanced out by the convictions caused by the reverse CSI effect? Again, very hard to prove. Very hard to possibly know. And if so, does that mean that the concept of jury trials is irreparably broken? I mean, it probably is. Some research suggests that 70-80% to 80 of jurors assume the defendant is guilty before the trial even begins, because why would the prosecutor bother taking the case to trial unless the person was guilty? That's not great, but I'd still rather have a jury than a bench trial if I'm ever guilty of something. Oh, I don't know. I don't know about that. I think I'd rather have the judge, because juries is a bit of a wild card. I'm pretty sure it's a lot harder to fool a judge than it is to fool a bunch of random idiots off the street. <laughs> Kevin, you went in with the assumption that you're guilty. I went in with the assumption that I'm being tried for something that I'm innocent of. <laughs> I was just like, no, I'd rather have a judge because he'll know that I'm not. He'll see it and be like, oh, he's not actually guilty. Whereas the jury will be like, I don't know. That shifty mother. Send him to prison. Stop talking. Go to jail. And like Saul Goodman said, all I need is one. Thanks for watching. There's a reflection. That's the Nuevitas baseball team. Are you sure about that?